Coming up on Art Rocks, a metery maker moving through the world with music and nature on the mind. People like it because it's just something from the area, not a generic store-bought card. Ceramics connecting viewers with the creatures and curiosities of nature, an architectural and archaeological marvel in Colorado, and some special techniques for photographing pets. The goal of each photograph is to bring out the pet's personality. Whenever I show someone their pet's photo, they're like, oh my god, that's him, that, that you captured Fluffy right there. These stories delivered to you on Art Rocks. West Baton Rouge Museum is proud to provide local support for this program on LPB, offering diverse exhibitions throughout the year and programs that showcase art, history, music, and more. West Baton Rouge Museum, culture cultivated. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello and thank you for joining us for Art Rocks with me, James Fox Smith, from Country Roads Magazine. Many Louisiana artists feel moved to represent our state's distinctive flora and fauna in their work. Metairie artist Sean Aylman is one of them. Using multiple media and working on many different surfaces, Aylman's creative process celebrates all things Louisiana. He even throws in Christmas cards based around Louisiana folklore. Stop by his Metairie studio and see. Christmas cards image start off with a Louisiana theme, based off of Louisiana either seafood or things like that, or Louisiana folklore, things like Papa Noel, Santa Claus with sacks full of toys, like fishing poles and shrimp boots and alligator pool toys and that sort of thing. Anything I can think of fun to put into the sack. People like it because it's just something from the area, not a generic store-bought card. The Christmas card with the crawfish and the artichokes just went together. It just seemed great because the red of the crawfish and the green of the artichokes are Christmas colors. So it just lends itself to the Christmas idea. And it's just a fun little thing where everybody goes to different crawfish boils and everybody tries to do a little something different. People throw artichokes in there, sausage, all kinds of stuff, corn. They're popular with both tourists and locals. Uh, I sell a lot of them off the internet through my Etsy and website. But they don't just go locally. They mostly go to the Gulf Coast, but they also go to the East Coast, West Coast, and everywhere in between. People just want a little piece of Louisiana. This is a favorite painting that I did a while back. I tried to do, make the crawfish intertwine with each other, and I call this one the view from the bottom of the pot. So the crawfish are looking up at the sky, and they just kind of, just a fun, colorful painting of just red, bright reds and bright yellows and, and the blue of the sky. The rooster at Mardi Gras is a version of Coro de Mardi Gras. Cajuns chase the chicken. They try to catch it to make gumbo. So it's a big part of Louisiana. It's a big part of Mardi Gras. So he has beads. I've tried to make it fun where I put beads and crown on the chicken. Being from New Orleans, I have grew up and I've listened to jazz, I've listened to blues, I've listened to all these different bands. There's brass bands and all kinds of different things. I've gone to a lot of music festivals. It just feeds into the culture, it feeds into the heritage of New Orleans. Those are some of the things that would make it to my paintings and, and that's what I want to share. I sell out at the music festivals and that sort of thing. I enjoy painting them and people collect them. They have their favorite artists and that's something they want. Same thing with the musical instruments and the cases. These people grew up, they played clarinet. They played trumpet. They played saxophone. And they want a piece of that to hang on their walls. So I enjoy doing it. My clients come from all over the place. They come in town. They will go to the festivals and then they see the piece and they really enjoy it. 
Among some of the people that I've painted over the years is a street performer down in New Orleans going out on Toulouse and Royal. He would just sit on the corner, he was blind in one eye, his name was Grandpa Elliot. Now he recently passed away, but that was his thing. He would sit there and play music. From that, he became famous and he got on Tonight Show, I believe, and he played for Playing the Chains and took world tours, just a street performer. But it was part of New Orleans. He played his harmonica and just sat on a five gallon buck and, and played for change, you know. So. so, for the past few years, I've had the pleasure of designing all of the posters for the New Orleans Bourbon Fest. It's a fun festival where they let you go in and sample all these high end bourbons. I try to keep all the posters with the Louisiana theme because it's the New Orleans Bourbon Festival. I added all things like alligators and fiddles and accordions and anything I could think of. And a little Cajun cottage back in the back with a bar, even with a little outhouse in the back. And I just try to mix them all together and fit them in there so it's like a puzzle and it all just fits in. I'm really happy the way it came out. Crawfish drinking his bourbon and stuff like that. I paint a lot of the birds, the wildlife of the area. Things like the pelican and the egrets and all of that stuff, they're just beautiful. They're so into the environment here. Everybody's used to seeing them. The cow image is just a fun image and I enjoy putting his ears over the frame and stuff. Cows are also a big part of Louisiana. The Baton Rouge area is known for its dairies. I don't really have a favorite painting. I enjoy the process. I enjoy the completion. I enjoy when somebody buys the painting and they take it home with them. I do have paintings that we did keep. I painted a lot of different things for when my daughter, who's, who's now 14, before she was born, I painted a bunch of different things for the baby's room. We kept those, I gave those to my wife, and those still hang in our house today. Things like an alligator as a tooth fairy and stuff like that. Just fun little paintings. I do sell a lot at different festivals, art markets, and that sort of thing. Everywhere from New Orleans to Lafayette to Baton Rouge. I also have things on consignment at different galleries and shops. It's important to just branch out to get more things out there. It's not just things on the internet or things at the shows or things at the shop. It's a mixture of all of them together. I've always liked to paint and draw. I strived at it when I was a child and I always wanted to grow up and do something in art. I started off in architecture in college and I switched over to graphic design. In the meantime I got a degree in fine arts painting and drawing and I went back studied graphic design in, in the graduate school. I paint in acrylics and watercolors, uh, things like swamps and the wildlife, uh, fishing, hunting, that sort of thing. I grew up here and, and that's what I enjoy seeing and that's what I want to express into my art. Louisiana is rich in opportunities to get to grips with the arts, so here are just a handful coming your way in the weeks to come. On these exhibits and others, pick up a copy of Country Roads magazine. To watch or re-watch any episode of Art Rocks again, just visit lpb.org slash artrocks. You'll also find all of the Louisiana segments on LPB's YouTube page.
We're northbound now headed to Bayview, Wisconsin. That's where you'll find ceramic sculpture Jeff Rush. He creates one-of-a-kind clay sculptures fired and hand-painted to give people a chance to really connect with the natural world, past and present. Come see. To me, my pieces are three-dimensional canvases. It's very fun to have these creature people. I think of them as ecosystems of all kinds of creatures coming together, making a bigger being, much like nature is. My name is Jeff Rash, and I'm a ceramic sculptor. Ever since I was a little kid, and that was the thing that I really excelled at, is working with um, clay. Uh, it was plasticine back when I was a little kid. And I would just remember it was in fifth grade, I made a plasticine pig and it was the best in the class. And so that's where I got my start. My work with clay um, involves building hollow forms. Um, and so I construct uh, the pieces with about an inch or half inch thickness all the way around, depending on how big they are. I really try to keep that about the same. If it gets too thick, things happen. Pieces crack. Um, so the, you know, each piece is built hollow, uh, like a pot. I think if I was going to make just pieces that I want to make, they would be all life-size human sculptures. Um, but I do try to supply different sizes for everybody else so the average person can take a piece home with them. Variety is the spice of life. <laughs> for a long time I was um, stacking animals, just making sculptures of stacked animals and I always wanted to work with the human form but I wasn't sure exactly you know, if I started stacking human forms, it might get kind of grisly. And, and so I, one day, uh, it clicked that, heck, I could make human forms by stacking animals. And that's what I did. When I start a piece, um, I work from uh, photographs of, say, a human form, and I have images of that person in pose from 360 degrees, so images all the way around. And I make sure, I, I blow them up on my walls, and, and I use a calipers to get the measurements right, proportions right, um, and so that's where I start, is, is getting the human form correctly proportioned. It's difficult. It, it, it's something that if it's wrong, it's wrong. Very obvious to people, you know, that the anatomy is wrong. You can fudge with animals. People just don't know, you know, they don't pay as much attention. And so you have to do things with the human form to get it right. And if it isn't, at least to me, and I, and I think I'm more picky because it's my work, but um, it needs to feel right. And then I sit back and think, well, what kind of an animal will fit in this muscle group to make this feel right? And so it's, it, then that just kind of evolves, and, and I don't know exactly what it's going to be until it happens. Recently, my pieces have been very earthy colors. I use a lot of browns and greens and things that you can just find outdoors find it in your own backyard, my backyard. But after a while, I get a little bored and then I will go back and, and add color. My piece behind me here, you can see, is very colorful and I have koi in my backyard. And so it's fun to change it up and, and add lots of color. I'm really have always been drawn to nature as a little kid. I would wander in the woods, catch creatures, um, just enjoy exploring and, and that stuff. And, and it's just something that's always kind of a longing for to go back to. 
And so I find uh, using nature in my work now is, is, is something that I can draw on and, and just continually explore nature and go from there. I have a product called Wall Spots, and they are faces that have a lot of fun with creating different expressions. And, and I like to have these groupings of faces and have them interact with each other. It's kind of, again, the, the ecosystem thought, but this time it's more emotional relationships between people. And my faces, which uh, they're like little mini green men, and they again are taken from putting the human form and putting them back into nature. And so the leaf form is something that you find in the wild and then merge that with the human form and, and conversations with each other. Well, it's fun showing my pieces at art shows. Um, you get a variety of people coming through and it's fun to look at people's expressions as they look at my pieces and quite often they laugh or uh, occasionally I've had people start crying in my booth over pieces. You can find stately mansions surrounded by spectacular gardens in sites all over the world. But there aren't many places quite so unexpected as an English-style castle perched high above Colorado Springs named Glen Airy. The house was built in the 1870s with numerous additions during the decades that followed. Visitors are welcome for tours, overnight stays, personal retreats and more. So let's take a look. It's this rugged place at the foot of the Rocky Mountains with an English style castle <laughs> right in the heart of it. It's a little shocking the first time you come to the grounds. It's so beautifully constructed. It almost is perfection and it looks like it's been here for hundreds of years. I think the way that you come into Glen Erie on this winding road, up a canyon, and there at the back, this castle is situated, looking like it's always been here. The thing that makes Glen Erie Canyon so powerful is, you know, it's part of the same geology as Garden of the Gods. The Garden of the Gods landscape um, consists, of, of course, of large, famous red rock formations. There are different colors of sandstones and conglomerates and, and granite that were actually uh, uplifted during the mountain building process of Pikes Peak. So as the mountain built, sandstones got tilted vertically. You don't really see these sandstone spires until you get here. The canyon opens up to you as you arrive at the castle and continues on. It's a beautiful place and it draws many, many people and always has. One person enraptured by the views was General William Jackson Palmer, who came to the region on a railroad surveying trip in 1869. After marrying his wife, Queen, they returned to the area and soon began construction on their dream home. John Blair, the landscape architect, saw an eagle's nest or an airy on the side of a beautiful rock here and gave the name Glen Airy to this space. The carriage house at Glen Airy was built in 1871. It was the first building built on the property, and William and his new wife, Queen, lived in the upper stories while they were waiting for their main house to be built. The original Glen Airy was a Gothic-style house. It was built in the form of a Latin cross, and it had about 27 rooms. It was built on the banks of Camp Creek that flows from the mountains down the Glen Airy Valley. Years of expansions and renovations created the estate we know today. After Palmer's death, Glen Erie was eventually purchased by the Navigators, an international ministry, becoming a conference center. The region has long been affected by natural disasters, including fires and floods. While surveying a site for flood mitigation work, the City of Colorado Springs lead archaeologist Anna Cordova stumbled upon something left behind the site of Palmer's trash dump. This is where one man's trash 
became a treasure for local historians. Context is everything in archaeology, and I started thinking of, you know, what am I close to? Who was living in this area at the time? An archaeology dig of this nature is actually very rare. To find more about Palmer over 100 years after he's gone. It's once in a lifetime. You can't tell a lot about one particular family in a public dump because lots of families are putting their trash in those places. The really unique thing about this site is that everything that's out there we know came from this estate, which is apparently a really rare thing in archaeology. The number of artifacts that we actually recovered were about 65,000. We have looked at every one of those artifacts. We have recovered and identified probably at least 50 different types of ceramics. Buttons, forks, knives, cooking utensils, cups, stemware, liquor bottles, pipes, flower pots, lots of different animal bones, wooden furniture pieces. We just uh, identified a tree cleat, which was really interesting. A cleat that you attach to the toe so you could climb the trees. There's also industrial items, so fire hose. We also have bottles that went into early fire extinguishers. Photographic equipment, so we have darkroom elements. There's a lot of medicinal things too, as well as medicine bottles, medicine jars, vials for homeopathic type of medicines. And a lot of people ask why we care about trash, um, why it matters, but trash can tell you a whole lot about households and people. It can speak sometimes even to ethnicity, socioeconomic status, uh, gender. It can answer so many questions that will talk about the daily lives of these people. So what they ate, what they wore, what they read. It's unedited and that's where its power lies because it's literally the raw material of their lives out here at Glen Erie. On the road again, this time to Tampa, Florida, where we'll meet Adam Goldberg, a specialist pet photographer. Goldberg uses his camera for good, making unforgettable photographs of animals to encourage pet rescue and adoption. I was doing adoption photos at the Humane Society here in Tampa and just doing it for fun on the weekends. And they asked me a few months in, hey, we love your pictures, we think the community would love them too, will you host a photo shoot fundraising event for us? And at that point, this was two years ago, I had no idea how to do that, how to get people to sign up, the marketing behind it. It went very well, sold out, hosted another one, that one sold out, hosted another one, that sold out. Then I started reaching out to other animal shelters in Florida, those sold out. So it took off because they just had a simple request. And that simple request turned into a career for me. And since that first event, it was in July of 2016, uh, I've hosted about 200 pet photo shoot fundraisers across the country and we just surpassed about $71,000 in donations. The goal of each photograph is to bring out the pet's personality. Whenever I show someone their pet's photo, they're like, oh my god, that's him, that, that you captured Fluffy right there. To get a good picture at a photo session, it's important to have a calm demeanor. The dog will feed off energy of me, of their owner. Then. I make a fool, a fool out of myself. Noises, squeaks, squeals, I bark sometimes. And the other thing is treats, and I use a lot of peanut butter too. It's important for shelter animals to have great photos because social media nowadays is so prominent. And without that, without a good quality picture, they're just going to get ignored. Suncoast Animal League gets a lot of interesting animals that have been through turmoil or trouble and I was doing a pet photo shoot fundraiser uh, for them and one of the foster parents had Clover and asked if she could bring her in for a photo shoot just to document her progress. Clover was actually caught in a fire. Her family was in uh, a shed uh, and the mom, uh, Daisy, pulled the puppies, some of the puppies out and actually she was found laying on top of some of the puppies protecting them. A few of the puppies had little marks on them but Clover kind of got the brunt of it where it looked like maybe that one of the pen panels fell on top of her and, and burned her pretty badly. When she came to us her immune system was so compromised that um, not only was she healing the wounds on the outside from the burns but she had some immune system issues on the inside that we had to work through as well. So she she's a little fighter. Adam is an amazing photographer. He does a lot of um, good things for the rescues in the area. Suncoast Animal League shared that fundraiser and 
photos of Clover on their Facebook page and through that exposure, Madeira Beach happened to be following our page. Our secretary, Trish Eaton, um, saw posts about uh, Clover being up for adoption at Suncoast Animal League and Clover was great. She came by, we, we liked her story and uh, she's just a real sweetheart so we, uh, we chose her and it's been great. With Clover being adopted by the fire department, I was so proud and it was just amazing to see her walk down in the commission meeting with her badge on and to give kisses to her new family and just know what kind of life she's going to have and the life she's going to touch, you know, the kids that see her that have scars and, you know, see what a fighter she is and, and just how strong she is and, you know, the help that she's giving to the firefighters because they go out and they see some pretty bad stuff, you know, on a daily basis and to come home to her and she's always happy and wagging her tail and happy to see them. It makes the station feel more like a home. The job can be stressful and it's real nice to be able to come back to the station and know Clover will be here. I was able to do a photo shoot with her again as a follow-up and the firefighters were there. It was amazing. We did some photos in, in front of the truck and it was awesome. Clover is the best dog for what she's doing now. We plan to involve her in like public education and teachings and stuff like that and um, like fire safety programs that we do with the schools and so she will have a job. Stop. Drop. Ew. And that is that for this edition of Art Rocks. But never fear, there are always more episodes of the show to be found at lpb.org slash artrocks. And if you just can't get enough of these enriching stories, Country Roads Magazine makes a great guide to what's happening in the arts, events and at destinations all across this state. So until next week, I've been James Fox Smith and thanks to you for watching. West Baton Rouge Museum is proud to provide local support for this program on LPB, offering diverse exhibitions throughout the year and programs that showcase art, history, music, and more. West Baton Rouge Museum, culture cultivated. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you.